Welcome to another episode of I Catch Killers. As far as I'm concerned, being a detective is the best job in the world. It was exciting and rewarding and a great way to make a living. I loved every day I came to work chasing the bad guys. I suspect today's guest probably feels the same way about his career in the cops. Not only was he a true detective in every sense of the word, who threw himself into each case, he also spent a lot of time wearing the blue uniform at the sharp end of policing. I didn't have the privilege of working with today's guest. He was a Queensland cop. He only retired a few months ago after an extraordinary career spanning 41 years. A former female colleague of his recommended him to me as a potential guest. She said, you just got to get this guy on your podcast. She told me a bit about his career and I liked what I heard. So I got in contact with him and we hit it off straight away. He spoke a language that I understood. It was clear he was a passionate cop who knew how lucky he was being able to do what he loved, helping victims, arresting bad guys, and genuinely trying to make a difference. He didn't chase rank and promotion. He simply wanted to do his job and serve the public as best he could. Having a look at his career as a detective, he's managed to get involved in some amazing jobs, including murders, extortions, kidnappings, and robberies. Just reading about his career gives me itchy feet and makes me want to be a cop, or still be a cop. He is, as I found out in our numerous conversations, also a bit of a character and definitely knows how to tell a story, and he certainly has plenty of them, so this should be fun. If you want to get a sense of life of a working police officer, well, you're in for a real treat with today's guest, most recently retired Queensland police officer, John Goodbanko. Welcome to I Catch Killers. Thanks, Gary. I can't, uh, can't thank you enough for that, uh, for that intro. Well, I didn't actually make any of it up, John. It's pretty well uh, true. And uh, I um, have been preparing for the podcast, um, as any good detective does, before you're about to sit down and interview someone and uh, doing a bit of research on you. And uh, your retirement, which was only a a month or so ago, was covered by two TV networks, and you even had Polair do a flyby. And they put a sign up on the uh, Surface Paradise sign that said, Farewell, Sergeant Gabanko, and I thought, I've never seen anything but a drunk hang from that sign. <laughs> well, you managed you managed to make it, but uh, they either uh, really liked what you did in the forty one years you uh, you served the Queensland Police on the Gold Coast, or they wanted to get rid of you. I'm not sure. What <laughs> what do you think it might have been? Well, they do kick us out at sixty, Gary. They apparently we uh, apparently we're not uh, um, any good after that, and they, uh, they they yeah we know when we join at seventeen that um, our use by date is when you turn sixty and yeah. And that's it. So uh, I was, uh, I felt the love went all the way out. So I don't think, uh, I don't think too many wanted to get rid of me. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, in all, all jokes aside, I think um, you see how some people retire, and there was definitely love in the room uh, for when you uh, when you retired. So you you had left an impression on the uh, area that you policed in for the your whole of your career, the Gold Coast. And the people I worked with that gave me that farewell, they left an impression on me. To be honest, I uh, yeah, I do I do miss my uh, my colleagues and um, they're. Uh, they're, you know what, you know how it is. Um, they form a special part of your life, um, and it's a bit of a void to, to be filled after you're uh, gone. It's only been five weeks, so I'm getting used to it. Yeah. Well, you were the longest serving uh, frontline police officer on the Gold Coast. You were 41 years there, so that's a you would have seen a lot of changes then. Well, you, you have to be 19 to be sworn in, and you get kicked out at 60. So I turned up at 19 in three months on the Gold Coast, and I. Don't think anyone else has sort of turned up and stayed on the front line for you know all, all of this, all of their service. I, I did a couple of periods of being officer in charge of stations and that whenever they had to fill in for someone who was sick or something like that for you know a month, two months, fifteen yeah. months or something. But um, generally, I tried to stay on the on the uh, on the road. Yeah, and you would have seen some changes, that's for sure. Oh, from the time you joined until now, my life's been like the game of rugby league. I sort of. Uh, and an, an analogy about that, it was like uh, the state of origin game. You know, it was a bit, a bit rough in the old days, and um, and yeah. uh, it, uh, it uh, sort of cleaned up a bit, and now everything's on video, and it's uh, all checked in the by the uh, referee in the. In the <laughs> In the in the in the bunker, but people have never played the game. <laughs> That's a good way, a good analogy of a way of uh, describing it. Now, uh, in again, in researching a little bit about your career, I, I like uh, a detective that can hold a grudge, and uh, you certainly can hold a grudge. And I, I'm just going to throw a name into you. If I mention the name uh, Stephen Greenwood, I want you to tell me about this person who probably uh, wished you never came into his life. Back in about, I was only just new into the CLB, about 1988, I think it was, and I 
come across him. He'd been going around stealing from old people in the yards. He was a fancied himself as a cricketer and he fancied himself as a triathlete and he'd, he'd ride around on his push bike and if he saw some old deer out in the yard gardening, he'd sneak around the back door and, and knock off a wallet and knock off stuff from a house. And uh, I caught him at um, Palm Beach with, uh, I just helped one of the uniform guys head there one day and we went out and rode the place and it was like an Aladdin's cave going into his place. And anyway, uh, we um, I spent a fair bit of time uh, for the next day driving him around to different jobs that he'd done. Mm. And... Um, Anyway, he uh, he got he got a lagging for it. He got got a couple of years, and um, you know the the victims that he left behind were um, they were, you know, we didn't didn't want to go out in the yard gardening anymore, and it was really really um, damaged them when I was going around yeah. to, to see some of them. Anyway, about about two years later, old Brendan Abbott I think has done an armed robbery of the Commonwealth Bank yeah. at Pack Fair. So uh, I was with the, uh, a couple of the other detectives looking for uh, looking for the armed robber. Um, couldn't find them. They'd got away. Um, but we, um, I spotted Greenwood again. I thought, well, what's, he, yeah. what's he doing out? He was at the back of a motel going through a handbag. Right. And so and, up, and to, up to his old tricks again. Just got out of jail. He's got a, got a, got a, a co-offender with him. Who, they just got out together in the last couple of days or so. Yeah. And he's going through a, through a bag in the motel. So behind the motel. So I went over and pulled him on and found out that the, the, They'd been stolen from Service Paradise up the road a bit further. Yeah. A couple of old deers on holiday from Victoria. So I got statements off them and everything, and I posed bail on him. They gave him bail, and he took off. Yeah. He took off on bail and uh, hopped on a big bird and flew out of Sydney to London, never to be heard of for about 22 years until he come back up and popped up on the on the radar. He met some, some woman overseas and decided to move back to Australia and... Uh, Made a noise complaint, and the local coppers had turned up up at Brisbane way there, and found him, uh, found him wanted on a warrant, and he denied it. He denied that he was the person. Yeah. It wasn't him. No, no, it's not me, not me. So they from twenty twenty two years. So, so they sent, and I thought I've still got the brief. I still had the, I still had the statements, but I couldn't. I checked up. I said to the prosecutor, "No, we we cannot. No, we're not letting this go. Yeah. I've, I've still got the brief. I've got the fingerprints checked, double checked." And uh, I went in front of him when he turned up at the front of the courthouse to to pull him on about his identity because he was turning up his case with his lawyer was that it's not me. Right. Oh. I'm like, and I he, was your arrest, the original arresting officer. Yeah. I was your second arresting officer. I spent over an hour, over you know, three hours in the car with you driving you around. Yeah, that's you. And <laughs> and it's me. You remember me? <laughs> that would have been sweet. It was. I was. I actually, actually. Uh, Invited the media along to stand there and, and film that one on the footpath. Just yeah, to, because he, uh, I think, why should he end up getting out? You got, you got to be, be the uh, the old deers. We had to, you know, leave the charges go because the old deers had uh, passed on. They'd passed on, and mm-hmm. uh, and the you no know, nothing come of his failing failing to appear. But it's like, um, you know, it's I remembered it, yeah. and and I think for all those victims, why should you just get off scot free? And and ironically, my my wife, um, who I've met since in in uh, in the last uh, 10, 11 years, yeah, she was to deliver mail to the to the old dears, and she remembered the victims of yeah. of this, and she was told me how they oh, they'd come out and cry to her at the uh, she putting stuff in the mailbox because someone stolen their stolen their stuff. Uh, it's a horrendous crime, isn't it? And, and taking you back when you said you first tipped his place over, and it was like Aladdin's cave, and that's how prolific they are. Yeah. Uh, and and targeting, so they're predators. They're targeting vulnerable people. Vulnerable people being the uh, the old ladies or uh, old people out to, in their front yard. And, and then if these people, it affects their lives. They don't want to. They don't want to go back out in the yard, and they don't want to go gardening, and they and they, and it really really deeply affects them. Yeah, well, it attacks their confidence too. Yeah. You know, and uh, I I hate seeing that. And you see it time and time again where people exploit uh, exploit the vulnerable. And uh, yeah, they're easy targets. And yeah, it's a big thing to them, and mm. they don't feel secure in their own home. So good on you. But uh, I would have loved to have seen the, the look on his face when uh, you turn up when he's denying who he was. Yeah, well, he, uh, he, there's he, some sweet moments in policing, isn't it? And that yeah. would have been a sweet one. Oh, there is, and he uh, he, he he complained about me, of course, and, and on it went. So yeah. that's uh, you know what that's like, Gary. Yeah, people yeah. making complaints about you at times, and and. Uh, well, it's a, it is the nature of police work, and I, I I don't think there's many police that haven't had complaints at some stage during their career if they're out in the front front line. Yeah, but, that's exactly uh, right. 
I, I to me that seems like uh, good uh, good policing. Even if he didn't get convicted of the crimes, at least he he knew that his past could come back and uh, and grab him. So I didn't care that he made a complaint. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, cops. Why? Why did you join the cops? Did you grow up wanting to be a policeman? What was the uh, What was the thing that drew you towards policing? I grew up on the Sunshine Coast, and um, I was, I, I was, I did go pretty well at school, but um, I just just over studying and um, um, didn't want to spend the next four years at a uni. And a mate of mine was talking about applying for the police, and I thought oh, I might throw in for that. And yeah. I went down, did the interview, and uh, I got into the academy, and it was. Uh, it was it suited me that it, that it's it's got there's got some you know some area to use your intelligence, but other areas to um, the physical aspect of it, uh, you know, training and and uh, yeah, it, it's interesting you say that because when I I'm always promoting uh, you know police as a good career choice, but there's such a cross section of experiences you get, as you said, you've got the physical training, but you've got to use your brain. You're communicating with people from all different uh, areas of society, so it's a it's a challenge, isn't it? It's a, and it's it's become become um, in the first year or so in the job, I I learnt that I was um, you know I liked the idea of winning on behalf of the community, you know, against the you know, it's good it's the classic good over evil, and it's always it's for me it's always been about. I come back to the football analogy, you know, the yeah. people people call us. They don't want us to turn up and and not win. Yeah, you know, if we we got to turn up and win on the day. Yeah, um, we can't turn up and say, oh, you know, gee, sorry, ma'am, that your husband's too big for me to deal with when he's you know been belting you. We've got to we've got to win and and you know save the day. The, the I, I understand where you're coming from, and there, sometimes if if police talk like that, there's criticism. Oh, you're too passionate, but it's passion with perspective, and. Uh, I always, my uh, thing was telling other police, how about you treat the victims like you'd want your own family treated? And I think if you work on that um, rule of thumb, uh, you're serving the public properly. Oh, exactly. And I, and I, and I, I actually recently went and spoke to some trainees just about to come out of the academy and uh, um, gave them a few, a few tips. And I was like, you know, they're treating people like like to be treated yourself. But the one thing is, like, be the police officer you would like investigating the matter that's important to you. Yeah, and you know, don't uh, you know, don't just you know turn up. It's not just a, a routine job. You know, be that, be the officer you would want investigating your matter. Well, you've got to understand that uh, policing. When you come into contact with the public, sometimes it's the most traumatic experience they've had in their life. Whether they're victims of an armed hold up, break and enter, if their car's been stolen, simple things like that. Like people aren't flushed with funds, and uh, when they they're losing out financially, it's traumatic, and that it. Breaches their trust that they have in society and and makes them feel vulnerable. And they they look to us to for a solution. We don't have all the solutions all the time, but yeah. um, it's, if we at least try, yeah, they appreciate it. Oh, that I think, and I, I've seen that over the years where victims don't feel that the police care, and that uh, that becomes a, a compounds the uh, problem they suffer from being a victim uh, victim of uh, crime. I think everyone's got a right to feel safe. That that's that's the that's the we we can't keep everybody happy. I, I, I just I talk about this with um, some um, disgruntled parents from time to time. I, I just spent also like fifteen years in uniform in Surfers Paradise, yeah. you know, and you you often sometimes get little Johnny gets a grazed knee during yeah. his encounter with the police or something, and I was like sort of uh, ex- explained to the. Uh, so the parents, you know, we run the safe night precinct. They're not the happy night precinct. I can't guarantee that your son's going or daughter's going to come home happy, but yeah. I'm passionate about them coming home safely. And because when you're up there, that the schoolies would have evolved into the huge event that it became. So that that must have been a nightmare to police. Look, it started out it started out in the late eighties um, or the mid eighties or so. It's, it's just a, and then just got bigger and bigger, and uh, eventually um, it had to be managed as an event. Because it, more and more people kept coming, and and it was it brought its troubles, and um, we you know, someone's got to look after it. But there's, there's a future prime minister or a future you know, um, governor general, perhaps amongst those kids that come from around Australia, yeah, that are going to come and say that we've got to keep them safe. And look at the cocktail for disaster with yeah, you know, not reigning in uh, the kids' uh, ability to have fun, but you got uh, people coming there. The pressure's off. They've just finished their uh, their schooling. 
they've got their whole life in front of them and they've discovered alcohol and the opposite sex and everything else that goes into that uh, that time period in their in their life it's a recipe for disaster yeah it, it, it used to be and it's um but it's it's they've um they've really you know thrown some some effort into it in the you know in the last couple of decades yeah and um yeah there was there was a period where it was it was quite um it was quite scary that you know that you your child might be in service paradise but you know what uh for end of year things these days, I think uh, the Gold Coast is probably as safe as the place for well, it. Well, that, and that's uh, yeah, kudos to the, the police. And I would imagine the council got involved and everyone to make it make it a safe place for them. It's a collective thing, but um, yeah, I feel you know, if like I've probably done done my bit, there'd probably be a few, a few people that'll listen or see that I think remember the old Sarge at Surface Paradise. Oh, that, that cranky old, that, yeah, cranky yeah. old one. I, I love, love, yeah. I love, loved uh, shutting them, shutting the door to listen to the you know. Put them in the naughty boy corner and yeah and uh, yeah we uh, but at the end of the day I don't think you know they go home I, I like that they go home with all their intelligence and all their all their ability to to um to be cranky because yeah. too many people you know if without the intervention there yeah. without that provision of safety too many people end up in a on a, on a on a life support system, you know, yeah. induced coma because of the serious head injury they got, you know, because someone that's gone overboard and, and fall off a balcony or yeah, yeah. Or, or, you know, getting, the getting assaulted, yeah, yeah, the assault. So, like, I like to think that, that that you know I've contributed towards that, right? That safety and uh, so when they when they put that sign up at Surface Paradise, I thought, yeah, I suppose I've I've, I've done my bit. So you, as a young cop, when you first came out of the academy and uniform and that, how, how did you find how did you find that? Because where was your First station. I was first station at Broadwich. We did mobile patrols all over the whole Gold Coast. So that would have been a uh, bit of a Wild West. Oh, it, time. Was, it was the Wild West, and it was yeah. it was um, yeah we uh, yeah we had, but the bikies in those days they were just drunks, you know, and they yeah we always won the fights because they <laughs> they were always drunk and we weren't, you know, yeah. and it was like uh, it was like being a you know, being a member of a football team, I suppose that you know there were, there were, everyone was pretty fit and. And uh, and sober and and uh, able to look after themselves and then the you know, bikies would be pissed and that in those days. But that was before and a, they... it's a little bit different like these days. Like yeah. you can't. It, well, I won't say it won't happen, but the group of bikies punching on with the cops or or whatever. But back in those days, early eighties, it was almost like, well, the cops turn up, the bikies are there, and let's see what happens. Oh, every second Sunday at the beer garden in surfers, you know. Yeah, like it's yeah, it's uh, it was there was always some some blow up with them, but um, you got to know. Got to know them by name at times, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even before you sort of grabbed them, you know. So what uh, what got you from? How long did you spend in uniform? I spent uh, about um, six years in uniform. Yep. And uh, I, we, after about four years, we went to um, Burley Head Station, and uh, I went to Burley, and I worked up there with a detective sergeant. He was he, he former detective sergeant. He was he did, yep. a former detective senior constable. He just got promoted to sergeant in uniform. Right. And he's always saying, "Oh, John, you know, you got to go to the CLB one day. You have got to go to the CLB one day." And yeah. uh, there was one day that the job came in, and um, uh, there was you know guns had been stolen with other property from a mm. from a a, um, a storage shed. And I, uh, the 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 officer in charge came out and said, "Oh, there's been a gun stolen from there, and you know cause we need someone to." We need, we need to get that off off the street before someone did an armed robbery because back in those days, was, uh, armed robberies were just quite common. Yeah, every you know, every Friday afternoon there'd be a stick up, you know, and um, and if, if there's a gun out on the street, it's guaranteed, yeah, or almost guaranteed, that it'll be used in a stick up. So the boss was concerned that there there was there was a possibility this gun was going to be used, and I thought, well, there was a there was a um, estate near there that uh, I knew some villains in, and I been we'd been hounding them and. And uh, I cultivated a couple of sources in there, and so I, I sent uh, I sent this um, uh, inquiries lady out with warrants. We used to do warrants commitment in those yeah. days. I said I got onto her. I said, "Oh, we got any? I want I wanted to sort of ac- activate the source that, uh, that I wanted her to need something from me." And uh, so I uh, sent the inquiry check. I said, "You got any? You know, she had she had like like uh, four kids, and uh, she was a rough rough old." Thing she was, and uh, so I sent um, sent the inquiry lady out to um, to tell her that we had warrant for for one of her kids. I said we've got we've got a warrant for one of the kids. Nah, I'll just take any warrant out there and just tell you, you got one, and, yeah. and tell you you'll be back tomorrow. And I'll wait for my phone to ring. Yep. Sure enough, my phone rings. She goes, "Oh, Mr. Kabanko, she used to she was she was called Mr. Kabanko. She was significantly older than me. Yeah, 
but um, anyway, she uh, she called me up and uh, oh, can you sort of hold off that warrant for me? And yeah, the warrant didn't exist. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I said oh, I'll see what I can do. But oh, well, I got you. You know, someone's just knocked off this gun at out at uh, Grace Brothers uh, Storage, and uh, she's and a, and a video. She's oh, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, give it about an hour. I get a phone call back, and you always, you know, it always started out. You know, oh, you didn't hear it from me, but mm. <laughs> and you need to talk to such and such, such and such. And yeah. uh, but, but it's not, but it's uh, it's not there. The guns out in the out in the bush. We don't know where it is, but it's out in the bush. He's got it hidden there somewhere. But uh, the other his mates you know, gone up north, and uh, he's uh, he's he's um, since then he's he's left because it was it was a few days before we knew there was a gun actually missing from the storage yeah. shed. So he'd, he'd he'd left and moved to. Moved up to Rockhampton Way, so uh, so we've worked out. Uh, so I said, I didn't want to. We had to protect your source and sort of throw people off the source, yeah. off, off off the track. You know, you can't just go out and go. Oh, you so and so told me you've you've done a break and enter and got a gun. And this yeah. young fellow was like sixteen years old or something. So we went and picked him up, and um, and uh, I um, sort of led him to believe that his mate had, had dobbed him in up at up, been picked up up north. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, we better get that gun off the street. And but, but in there, I said, "Oh, he said that you knocked, you've got the gun in the video." And he's like, "Oh, that's oh, that's bullshit." He, he 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 got the he got the video. Oh, I just got the gun. Right. And I, oh, right, well, let's go and get the gun. Okay, so that that's what you've described there, and I, I can re- read between the lines, and it, it's creative policing. But that's the type of policing you need when there's a gun out on the street, and you've got uh, yeah kids that are it's going to escalate. I did a murder exactly mm-hmm. from. Break and enter, kids breaking into a school tuck shop, then broke into a house and found a gun, and that led to an armed robbery, then a murder, innocent lady. So, yeah, the importance of getting uh, uh, that type of policing can't be underestimated. Gary, I was working with a with a lady on that day, and I never I never forget it because I, I I love her to death. She's yeah, she's an awesome awesome uh, officer. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, like she was like, oh, we, oh we, can't, we can't do that, John, John, John you can't, oh, we, oh, we can't yeah. do that. The old uh, the old sergeant was awake up to what was going on, you know, yeah. and he's like, "No, nah, look, you've got to go to the CLB. You're sort of wasted here because there are hunters and there are gatherers, Gary. I think you know yeah. you and I've sort of both, you know, they've, you and I have both uh, been hunters in our time, and, yeah. and you tend to to go that extra yard, and you just, you you know where to start, you know, yeah. like some people just wouldn't know where to start." And and it comes back to knowing your area, Most knowing important. who you, knowing who your people are, cultivating your you know informants and yeah. your sources, and going and yeah, we didn't we didn't, those days we didn't have videos to go and find or do a phone dump and see who was in the area or anything like that. But we, the, you, you've made a good point there because it really was about the way you communicate with people to get the breakthroughs and the informants and people that want to, you'd get the call, I've got something to tell you, and you'd go meet them at the pub and all of a sudden you've, you've been pointed in the right direction where the uh, where the crime. Well, look, this lady that told me, she thought I was wonderful because all of a sudden I made a warrant to disappear. It yeah. didn't exist in the first <laughs> yeah. place. Yeah. Um, the, the other guy, uh, the kid, he was grateful that I gave him the opportunity to to give it back and, and he, you know, they become suitable for caution then, you know, like yeah. if they, if they confess the offense, they, they become suitable for caution and they're helpful and it's like a, they, they, they get off a lot, uh, a lot lighter as a kid, you know, and, yeah. um, and I stopped making that, stop that kid from making poor choice with that firearm, like yeah. you just said. And at the end of the day, everyone's happy. The boss was happy. Everyone's happy. Everyone's safe. Um, does it really pass the pub test? Um, I, I don't know, but I, you know, that, that's you know that was over thirty years ago, and I don't uh, look, care. I I think like thirty years ago that would yeah all be very acceptable. Today mm. they might go well yeah you, know, you crossed the line you you told the lady she had a warrant and but when you look at it back there in those times in those circumstances, and you did make an interesting point. Policing was different back then. It was about the communications because. You can't check phone records or download electronic data and help solve the crime, and you didn't have DNA and everything else that comes into play. I, I sort of we get trusted with investigations when yeah. we, you know, in our in our work. I talk, I'm still talking in current term. I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm with you. I was agreeing in <laughs> but, our work. I, I've been but, out a lot longer than you. So we, yeah, but we get you get trusted with an investigation. Yeah, and you get trusted by the community to go and do something about it. And Look honestly, that that uh, 
the courts accepted back in those days that the police had to use some subterfuge at times. You know, yes. you, look, you know, you think about our, our drug agents; they're all, they're yeah. all, they're all, they're all living a lie. Well, that, that's right. Quite often, what you've described, or, or different cases, just generally speaking, you put it before the court, and the court's got to make an informed decision. And, and quite often, it goes in the favour of the police that, uh, yeah, this had to had to be done. And I don't think either of us are sitting here saying there should be no rules. There has to be rules. There's mm. got to be the checks checks and balances. But there's got to be that uh, that grey area that can you can push to uh, to get uh, get results. You know, I'd never got in trouble at any time if, if I didn't join the cops. It's like a, yeah. it's a it's a risk. It's a it's, you know they're, they're, there's because we try. Yeah. Um, yeah, we stay within the rules. Uh, I think our power, or the power that you have as a police officer, makes you accountable. And with that, that's where there's always a risk. Like you hear police you know, coming unstuck for this or that. There's a risk when you've got power and there needs to be the checks and balances. So we're a little bit more accountable than the general public. I think there's a test and it's, uh, it's the two key words here is honest and in good faith. Yeah. And, and the things that I sort of did there were honest and in good faith. And- you know, down the track, you know, like you look at it, who do you want, someone kidnaps your child, Yeah. who do you want Yeah. hunting them? Do you want the person who thinks, oh, no, we can't do that? Or do you want Gary Jubilin or John Gabanko type going after, going after the person? Yeah. And that's probably, you know, why you and I sort of have a... a a rapport here, you know. We well, un- understand. Un- understand. I said as a yeah when I met you first up that yeah you sp- speak the language, but uh, what you said there, honest and in good faith, yeah that that holds the test in court too, mm. and that's why I've said to a lot of police over the years where they're a little bit uh, worried about why did you do it? You did it for this reason, and it was you're being honest and it was in good faith, and I, I think that holds up uh, holds up pretty well, even in the strict rigid rulings of the court, that still carries uh, uh, carries some weight. You might buy yourself about three days in the witness box sometimes because of it. <laughs> but, uh... Well, we were saying before we started that uh, I, I know with uh, young police I was working with as, as I got further up in my career and they were always concerned that, yeah, we're going to get uh, criticised in the, in the witness box. And I point out that it does not matter what you do. If someone's defending a charge that you've laid against someone, you're going to get criticised in the witness box. That's the theatre that's caught. So, yeah, I, I think it, it's naive to think, oh, we'll do this and we'll never get criticised. You're going to get criticised. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, yeah. whatever. And then that's uh, – actually, I remember giving evidence in, in, in the Supreme Court once and I gave that exact, that, exact, that exact sort of answer. You know, that I gave up trying to keep lawyers happy long ago. I'd like to – you know, I'll give you something to argue about. <laughs> well <laughs> – and it does get you. It does get you an extra hour in the witness box, or an extra day in the witness box, because you're holding holding your line. But I've I've seen other police that uh, you know capitulate because of the pressure, mm. um, and someone someone walks free. And I'm not talking about capitulating in telling an untruth. It's un, on oath, but holding your line. Why yeah. you did this and justify what you um, do. I I've said whatever you do, if you can justify it, you're in a in a good space. Exactly, so. and um, yeah, as long as you stick to that. Honest and good faith. Yeah. Um, sometimes, yeah, we do the the lines. You know, the no no exact rule for every single eventuality. Yeah. But you've, if you stick with you know, that, you're doing um, doing something that uh, with good intention. Yeah. Usually, it'll come up out of come up okay. And and sometimes you you test the boundaries, you push the boundaries, and that's how the boundaries change quite yeah. often. So it. it uh, yeah, that's where case law comes into it because you've you've done something and uh, it's changed the uh, changed the landscape. You mentioned uh, a kidnapping and uh, one of the cases that uh, I'm aware that you worked on was the uh, abduction of a ten year old girl. I think her uh, father was a um, Chinese businessman, and this was back in um, 1989 and the two million dollar ransom. Kidnappings before you start. I, I only did a few within my career, but they're a pressure investigation, aren't they? Because the stakes are particularly high when you're uh, you're trying to recover someone. So, talk us about that uh, that case. Well, I uh, I had a I had a daughter who um, should have been uh, twelve months old at that time, and uh, it it really hits home, and you get a phone call. At, you know, you just probably got to bed about you know ten or eleven o'clock. You know, by midnight, you called to duty, and uh, someone's stolen someone's daughter 
from their house. Mm. Three men have come in with the with balaclavas and pistols, and they've come in and they've stolen someone's daughter from 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 uh, a, a big uh, mansion over on uh, Benoa Waters, and uh, and they're holding the child for ransom. And uh, the detective inspector called every detective on the Gold Coast to duty. Yeah. Um, that he could get hold of that night. He had people ringing us, and uh, um, we we all rallied. And uh, you know, where do you start? Um, uh, we you know were doing the phone boxes and stuff, etc. But it was yep. a, it was a really quite a big um, a big investigation. But uh, and and talking through it, like the the ransom demand, how was how was well, it, 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 it dropped it, it dropped a couple of times. Yeah, um, and uh, eventually, look, we have. Um, now, now we have the Amber Alerts. Yeah, this was probably the first Amber Alert that really Humphrey Bear didn't go to air that day on Channel. You know, to, 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 <laughs> yeah, heaven, heaven forbid. No, I, look, at night o'clock, there was they were doing live crosses with this satellite uh, yeah. TV. Um, so it satellite. had it had hit the media and oh, everyone, the media it was yeah. saturated. Yeah. You couldn't. You couldn't turn a radio on without them talking about yeah. it. The the detective inspector, let's call him Media Martin, Ken Martin, greatest, yeah. uh, great, great boss, great boss. Yeah, and he just called all the media in and saturated. This is what we're dealing with. This is what, and and it's kind of uh, you know be, become a um, you know the thing down the track where they where they have these amber alerts, but they didn't need an amber alert. He's called up and he wanted the media covering this, yeah. and we need help. Because you know, police are only we only function with the help of the community, yeah, um, and that was the the help we were getting, and geez, we were getting some help come through. And just just to explain, because people mightn't be familiar with Amber Alert, I, I wasn't familiar with Amber Alert until the first time I used it, but, but uh, it was a situation where, uh, yeah, as you've described or we're talking about, where a child has been abducted, so. Everywhere that you can saturate, and this is not done in those days, mm. but now. So you put out uh, to the media, everyone becomes aware of it, and the, the sign posted on traffic, uh, you know, the type of signs, signage you see on uh, the expressways and that type of thing. Look out for this car, look out for this child, or, or whatever. Look, it's, it's like a, it goes like a cyclone warning, you know, like yeah. a, an alarm sort of thing at the beginning of the news bulletin, and they, you know, there's an amber alert being put out. And, and rightfully so, there's nothing worse than someone's child being. Being taken and um and I, I look, thankfully we recovered this girl safe and well because it became so hot for them they did, they they dumped her. So and, that was that was part of the strategy mm. and I think people uh, need to understand that uh, you can use media as a strategy. So that the the strategy was to put pressure on the the bad guys that have um, taken the child. Yes. And uh, how how did it evolve? How did you get a breakthrough on it all? Well, the um the. People in uh, hotels, uh, a lady at a hotel recognised uh, sort of the a description of a male and thought it was, this was a bit bit strange. So she'd caught up, and so we went and intercepted the car, and um, and there he was. And uh, you know, was the child in the car? No, no, we yep. they'd already dumped the child, and the child had been recovered safely. But then the right. hunt, the hunt was on for the villains, then. Yep. and um, we can't have people running around stealing kids. No, no, it's um, and uh, and it was. Um, there was, there was a um, yeah. There was a lead that um, that took us to uh, you know from from our, from getting that guy, the first guy we that we uh, picked up, um, and that led us to a uh, hotel room. And I remember going to the hotel room and and searching that. And you know, I guess the detective's not not exactly glamorous going through someone's rubbish bin. And these were Asian guys, and they've got this rubbish bin that's full of whatever Chinese they didn't eat. And I'm sifting through that, and I'm finding the rings of her mother's mothers that they've they've taken the stones out and dumped right. and dumped the rings and stuff. And I'm finding that in the rubbish. And uh, um, the way I found that um, in the first place was uh, for a receipt that he had the guy had had in his in his pocket when the first guy we caught. Yeah. And then it worked out from there. And then we started started going from there. And um, yeah, we we ended up in um, in Moolumbar. It's a bit of a long story for today, but um, we ended up in Moolumbar and talking to the other the other yeah. two guys. And uh, it was a it was a ring, and it was a it was a it was a bit of a like, bit of an overseas trend, I think, yeah. to, to to kidnap a, a child for ransom. So they they had uh, gone to the place because the, the father was deemed to be wealthy. He was he's he imported um, Mattel dolls 
Uh, right. uh, Barbie dolls for Mattel. Okay. So every Barbie doll that every little girl was playing with in, in Australia was being imported by this Hong Kong businessman. Yeah. So he was um, he was quite wealthy, and they and they these villains had the um, belief that he would have two million dollars in his safe, and when he didn't have it, they that's took, when they took the child. Did he have to make? Did the father have to make a decision to call the police? Because I'm sure they said don't go to the cops or. What yeah, was? That there was there was a there was people that yeah they were. And the trouble is that you know the people that they trust aren't always the the good ones because that's exactly what it was in, involved. There was a someone close to the family was, was right. setting it up. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a horrific crime, isn't it? Uh, kidnapping. All the we caught all the villains, yeah. and all the villains sort of went away and um, end up in New South Wales working with New South Wales coppers and and uh, funny that you know I, I had the opportunity of working with really good detectives. Yeah. Like I was a junior, I was only junior detective yeah. at that time, so. Um, you know, I mentioned before to you just before I, I was I got in I was popular in the CLB to work with I suppose for for detective sergeants because I was a touch typist and we used to do <laughs> records of interview. Yeah. So I, I'm so I'm the touch typist on these records of interview. So I was always included on the big jobs. All my partners would have been detective sergeants when I was a trainee. I was a training detective and. Having that experience of working with an array of different detective yeah. sergeants, you pick the good bits and the bad bits of each, and you sort of go go from there. And I had, um, I, I was, was a plain clothes senior Connie at the time, and uh, yeah, like it was, I saw some really good um, good work amongst them all. And, and and that's quite interesting that it's your skills as a uh, proficient touch typist, but that was a valuable skill. Like any any sergeant would. Grab you and go. I want you, son. I I learnt to type alongside Steve Earle and the Crocodile Man in in year nine and ten at school. I went to school with him and, and oh right, and he okay. was sitting there typing away beside me, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and and who would have thought those skills would have uh, helped you the way it who, did? Who, who'd, have, who'd have thought? And our English communication skills. Who'd have who'd have thought that passion? That you that... never had an interest in catching crocodiles. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, I did just do dirt bike riding with him. He'd pull up and you know have a look under a. Bit of steel or something to see if we could find a snake. You know? Oh, so it, well, it was in his DNA. Oh, right he, oh he, got, he grew up in a on a reptile park. You know, the, yeah. the snake had come into. We had a park next door. A snake had come into the yard, and he'd go over and grab it and put it back in the in the bush. You know, and the teachers would be saying, "Oh, everyone, stand back, everything." No one would just come over and pick it up and put it in the bush. You know, and uh, but uh, we had the same English teacher, and uh, she taught us both to be. You know, right through. Um, she was an old English teacher. Yeah, and English mistress, and. Uh, she taught us to be be passionate and and um and to communicate and express ourselves and you know he, he yeah well he he, 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 amped, he amped it up a lot for the you know yeah. in in his uh in his performances um um but uh, just a natural heroic brave sort of a guy you know it's, oh that's he'd interesting go, he'd go out in the biggest surfs and stuff you know yeah when you go surfing you go out. There'd be a cyclone. He'd go out and you know there'd be. Well, two- yeah, I, I saw some of his stuff before he uh, he sadly passed away, and uh, he was fearless, wasn't he? Oh, he was. And yeah. uh, but um, but he, yeah, the, the, say the he, you know we I watched the the English teacher bring the passion out uh, in him, and probably a you know a bit of it's come out in me, I suppose. And as you know, um, court is theatre, and you know, this our old English yeah. teacher she used to take us to Brisbane to go go and watch theatre, and uh, I just suppose that's probably become part of our. Part of our thing that we would, um, you know, probably express ourselves and not be away, not be afraid and, and, to. And like people, like legal types, might, uh, yeah, frown upon that it's not uh, not theatre. But uh, I'm telling you, when the barrister is in court, they're uh, they're performing, they're performing to the jury, to the judge, and everyone else. It, it, it is a theatre, theatre guided by the parameters of the the legal system, but it's a theatre. I used to like. One of the things they they get try to get power on you. They they look at you when they're talking to yeah. you. You know they're looking. They they try to get you in the eye. I like to sometimes just like take that power away from yeah. them and turn and talk to the jury and give my answer to the jury. Yeah. And yeah. you know the the old blue eyes and um you know you you'd, yeah they they don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> now you're um you also found yourself as the uh, officer in charge of the casino, uh, Jupiter's Casino, and we're working there. Um. Tell us about that because that was a hotbed of crime from my memories of New South Wales when bad guys skipped the state. Invariably, they were going up to the uh, Gold Coast to the uh, casino. Look, we uh, always, always what, what to... year was it? That, uh... 2000. Yeah. I went yeah. there just before the, just before the, uh, the, I got there just before the, um, we had the problem coming up before it. Um, the, 
Y2K. Remember the old Y2K? Oh, yeah, the world was going to stop. Yeah, the world yep. was going to stop. Yeah, but it was just before I got there. And so I took over in January just after when the world didn't stop. Yep. And um, the, uh, yeah, like the having a presence there, it's always about ensuring the integrity of gaming yep. and ensuring that, that, um, that people aren't just coming in and, and um, there's no crime going on there. People aren't, you know, just trying to stop the, you know, possibility of laundering money, bringing, um, and it was, uh, the fact that that the the casino didn't have a really bad reputation was yep. was was uh, because of the government regulation over it, and yep. we were just the enforcement arm of the government regulators, and uh, they uh, they uh, obviously game regulation they they paid all their bills basically. There was four of us would, would be there um, consistently, and, um, and that what, was what, good experience. What type of crime was it attracting? Look, um, well, they had uh, had. Did have once where a guy had got um, got robbed on his way home from uh, from the casino, and that's that's a terrible thing to be to yeah. go on because we can't have people um, being um, followed out of a casino and uh, and and having their um, their winnings uh, removed from them. Yeah, um, that's that really is um, um, was one of our things to make sure that people are safe yeah. when they when they come there. But um, there were these. Uh, Colombian crime gang guys. So I got when I went there, I'd read about them in a magazine. Yeah, and I made a, a bulletin, a crime crime bulletin that they mm. existed, and they they get around. Um, they'd fly from around the around the world. Yep, and uh, they called them Colombians, but they turned out we learned that they were Peru um, Peruvians. They were from Peru, right? And um, actually, uh, it's a bit like um, like the you know the fictitious thing that you sort of never really come across. I don't know if you've I've always heard about the Yakuza, but I've never met one, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's kind of like that. And um, I came close to catching a Colombian drug deal that was importing in a suitcase or something. And I always wanted to, I wanted to catch a cattle rustler and yeah. a Colombian <laughs> drug dealer. Never, I, I think I, I did charge someone with cattle rustling, but uh, never caught the Colombian no, drug did, dealer. No, I, did, I didn't get any of them either. <laughs> so, but that that was a group. So there was oh, yeah. four of them, and they, they'd come into the country for a short time. There'd, there'd be a there'd be a leader. Yep, and he would stay in the in the fancy hotel, and the the three um, helpers yep. they would stay in low budget accommodation. Yeah, and um, they had like an MO, and they'd fly around the world. Um, I caught one early in the piece who knocked off a bag. They go, they do casinos, five star hotels, and and airports. Yeah, and that was their MO. And they'd fly around the world. They'd have fake passports. You wouldn't know who they were. Yeah, they're not recorded here. And you, when you caught one, they'd go to court for a five hundred dollar fine or something, which would never be paid, and they'd be gone. Yeah, because you couldn't show the there wasn't the ability to prove the you know the likely criminal history that they might have because yeah. you'd have to send it off to Interpol, which takes forever. And and three months later, it'd come back. You know, you can't wait for three months for yeah. something to come back. And you know, it's probably his cousin that's that's doing it. Yeah, uh, back in back in South America, you know, it's you you just don't know, and you can't trust it. So they they would target people who have had a, a winning, or obviously people who are flush with uh, cash, or just people just sitting in a restaurant that come yeah. along, just take the bag from over the back shoulder and yeah. uh, and run off. But the one takes it, passes it to the next one, who then passes it to the next one, and then it's in the car. And by the time before the person works out their bag's gone, they. It's gone. It's, yeah. it's it's driving. It's driving down the Gold Coast Highway. Yeah. Um. And they do the same at the airport. They come up with a with a, with a they squirt sauce on you. Oh shit! Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. And they they would squirt sauce on you, and they'd be one to be wiping you. The other one's lifted your wallet. Yeah. And it's already gone to the second one, and it's out in the car, and he's gone. So um, I've got all these extra cameras put in around the car parks and that because we we we'd get this great vision in casinos. I love working in the casino because <laughs> there's so much so much vision everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, they um, um, I just got the cameras put on the car park uh, exit so we could I, see I, the number plates. I was plates. surprised. I, I had a tour of that uh, for security up there on a, a job and seeing how much was uh, you could keep an eye on things. I, I spoke to the to the boss there. Uh, he was a former former yeah. police officer, um, one of the head of security. And I said, "Look, uh, you, you know, convince the big bosses to put cameras there, there, and there. I'll catch your offenders every time for you." Yeah. And uh, sure enough, that's where we end up. Um, finally, got this one, and uh, he was the head of them. Yeah. And worked out that the, what the car was, and we checked out the car, and the and the, the car had been dropped off to him at a particular hotel. So I called up the hotel. Yeah. 
um, a big, um, big, big complex, and I called up and spoke to the manager, and the manager said, "Oh, yeah, that bloke's staying here." Well, um, um, but the but I said, "Well, is he there now?" And uh, he's gone down. He's gone out and he's come back about a minute later and he said, oh, no, he's not there at the moment. I said, look, you got a room opposite him or something where we can come and wait. He said, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, I have actually. So I said, all right, so grab my mate and work, mate, and we down we went. We're going to sit down there and wait for this bloke. I mean, we walked up to the room. It took us about five minutes to get to the room. And I said yeah. to the manager, I said, when I spoke to you on the phone before, I said, you weren't gone this long. It's taken me five minutes to walk to this big complex, you yeah. know. It's just taking five minutes to get here. He said, oh, I didn't come up to the room. I just went down to look in the, you know, had a look in the car park and the car wasn't there. And I said, oh, oh okay. So so I knock on the door and you hear this, see? And I, <laughs> ah. and I just pushed the manager back out of the way and I said, oh, it's the manager. And you get that. You know, when you go to, like, you see the door, it just cracks and you get that little bead of yeah. sunlight that, do you know that it's it's the door's now, to now go locked? In. So I've just cracked the door, just got him straight down the forehead with the with the with the door on the other side. He was there for me to, you know, that was his yep. that was his thing. He's peering around the door, and anyway, then got him. You know, they carry knives and they'll slit yeah. you. They'll slit you and run away, and you never know who it was. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we uh, we got this guy and. Um, Identified his fake passport. How they, how they we knew how they were doing it, and then checked his passport. There was a, there was faults we knew about them, and uh, end up um, I worked out I worked out then that they were sending money overseas via um, Western Union, right? And he was using his fake passport to send it to a name over 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 South America, and the name in the South America was his real name, right? So through Oztrack, I could work out. Everywhere he sent one, so yeah. I got onto the Australian Federal Police through the ice track. They couldn't send me a charge, and, and this guy had been in Melbourne, he'd been in Sydney, and he'd been in Brisbane. The week before that, he was in Thailand. The week before that, he was in right. So it was a real international he, operation. He was. He worked out that in the end, we, we got to the bottom of it all. They he front went from Peru over to Brazil, got his fake passport in Brazil, flew to Los Angeles. Was it was at no, Los Angeles? Hey, Los Angeles, then on, yeah. then on to um, on to Las Vegas, was stealing stuff in Las Vegas over to the Netherlands, yep, um, Amsterdam, and then down to Bangkok, and then to Australia, and each week a new country, and they fly around the world and they send all this stuff back via Western Union and via a international courier for the your watch, your okay, all, all, your, the, all, all, all that stuff was all going the... was all going back back to themselves, and that was the he was the head. And and he would have started out as one of the one of the, the lowlier guys previously, so I I got a I, I was had a, had to get some um, FBI contacts to to try and accelerate the yeah. how we could find out these people and because it was it was a little bit hard so I actually got onto a uh, you mentioned before about a, a drug dealer from overseas I, I I took a drug dealer back to um, Los Angeles on one of those um, immigration deportations yeah. I took this villain back who'd finished his time out here and the immigration department kicking him out and uh, I escorted him back to Los Angeles and then went on to Las Vegas where I met with with Australian uh, with um, uh, FBI people and you had your contacts because these these same crooks uh, they're flying all around the world but every the FBI's got someone in, every, in you know each country to to try and make these inquiries you know so I was, I, I got I got a bit of success there so yeah. I, and I've started to work out and learn more about their their MO and um, and in the end. Uh, I put up to the magistrate. I've got, I've got this bloke in in custody, and I put up to the magistrate that he is, presents to you as a first offender. He is not a first offender. This is That's, what this they're is doing. History. This is what they're doing. I can't tell you what his criminal history is, but I can tell you he is like a this is his a MO. career criminal that's flying around the world doing this, and he doesn't present. He he is not a a clean skin that, that's before you now. No magistrate. Looked at the whole thing and uh, put put together you know, for for a guilty plea. Yeah, slotted him for six months. Oh, good. good. And and that disrupted. Yeah, that disrupted them coming there. And and as and as the um, the boss of the Queensland Office of Game Regulation sort of said to me, you know, said, oh, you know, wow, you know, you, you, he was pretty impressed with the you know the the, eff- the extra sort of effort that that we sort of put, put into, into what was just started out someone's handbag getting stolen from a restaurant, but. 
it comes back to geography and ownership. I, I sort of like in policing, you know, you, you've got an area. Yeah. It's yours. Own it. Yeah. I, I do understand that mentality. It's your patch and the, it's almost like I take it personal if, uh, you know, crime's occurring on my, my patch. And when I was a local detective, that's how, how I felt. Like if, yeah, if someone's running rampant in the area that I'm meant to be policing, you take it uh, take it personal. And not in a, not in a bad way. Like it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's the way it should you should do. Yeah, it's it's um, it's it's a um, it's something that gets missed when we get into too large, uh, like centralised um, yeah. areas. And um, you know, like uh, I sort of come back to that, that that thing with the when I was a young fellow in the uniform. You know, you know knowing where to start in the first place. It, is, ma- it makes a difference in policing, and I, I want to talk to you uh, talk to you about that to, at the end because. Having spent forty-one years in uh, in the cops, you've obviously got some strong views on uh, what uh, what makes good policing. But you touched on um, immigration deportations, and that's mm. something that uh, I I'd been involved in too, and taking uh, taking prisoners back. Tell us about your experiences with that. Well, I got to uh, first off took a guy back to New Zealand, and we don't we didn't gen- we generally tr- you know didn't we didn't take them if we had something to do with the case. Yes, yeah. I was offered to take that bloke back to South America, but I wouldn't take him no, back. And no. so, because I was, I, you know, I sort of got him with the door. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and he'd know who I was, and um, I'm not going to enjoy my time back there. Mm. But basically, we would, um, it was like a secondary employment thing for us. And we would, if we took someone, escorted them, we, we worked on the way over. But after we arrived and kept them, kept the airline, kept the aircraft safe from, from uh, any um, potential risk from the person being a, a prisoner that's been finished his time in Australia and now leaving the country. Um, you arrived and you had four days to uh, to enjoy the country. Yeah, off duty. And and so this is you know, where the it, it was secondary employment. You had to mm. get approval. This is what we had to do in uh, yes. New South Wales Police. But you'd get a call and say a prisoner needs to be taken back to such and such. Uh, can you escort them? And the reason I think they choose police is not so much our powers because we're out of our jurisdiction, but we know how to um, yeah, uh, keep people calm and, and control situations and identify uh, potential risks. There's always like – I flew through Rome a uh, couple of times and yeah. um, you always get stuck on the tarmac there. It's uh, I, you know, We were flying on to um, – we flew in. I took some guys back to Singapore once and we got to Singapore and, and – um, they, uh, they, they, we got met and assisted by the by the Singapore police, and they got this, they, they got annoyed about it. These couple of couple of Romanian drug dealers were taken mm. back, and uh, the next place, some plane lands in plane lands in uh, in Rome, and I was with a couple of couple of young. We were, and then we were supposed to get on the next flight onto onto Greece, and the, I was with a couple of young young um, well, new detectives to to it. They hadn't done done these things yeah. before, and I'd done one or two before, and. Uh, and they, um, they, uh, this couple of guys started playing up, and I was, sit, I was there was three of us at Escort and two, yeah. And I was uh, sitting back away from them, and they, these two guys were sitting there, and they said, "Oh, we've got a bit of a problem here." And I looked up, and, uh, and there's these guys. And they're like, "Yeah, now we've arrived in uh, Europe. You'll be seeing that Europe is all one country, and you'll no longer be travelling with us. You'll no longer be holding our passports. You'll no longer be holding our aircraft, our tickets, and you'll uh, you'll be no longer giving us plastic cutlery. And uh, and uh, you'll uh, you will see now you are the foreigners. Now you are you'll see now Europe is all one country." Yeah. And you will be seeing that you are the foreigners, and I said, uh, "Yeah, finished." And they're like, "You got anything more to say?" No. Um, look to the front of the aircraft, and they look to the front of the aircraft, and there's a cabaret stand there with the machine guns, and yeah. I'm like, "They don't shoot the ones wearing a tie." <laughs> <laughs> right either. And I said, "You can either go and just." Travel on with us and do as you're told, or you can spend a night in the, in the cells here in Italy. I don't really yeah. care, but you, you hit these problems and you think, and it's, it comes down to your communication skills well, and your ability to sort of do it. And that's why they like the cops because other they used to other people outside of them that aren't used to dealing with that. Yeah. And it's like, oh, well, how do you do it? What, what powers have we got? You know, what are we here? And there's there's a, there's a, I, it's, a it's a skill I, I took. I, I 
done quite a few um, the, the deportations, but uh, took a Frenchman that arrived in uh, Sydney and he assaulted the um, AFP police and so they weren't going to let him in and they needed him taken over. So it was short notice, fly this boat, bloke back to Paris. And I basically fought with him the whole way. <laughs> He, once the plane took off, he was just out of, out of control and we're down the back of the plane and uh, it was just a struggle. So all the way and we stopped off at Heathrow Airport and uh, he, what control do you have on him? He, we had a two or three hour delay for the, the plane. I had his passport and we couldn't communicate. I, I didn't speak French, he didn't speak English, but I, I made a sign that I'd be ripping the passport up and then pointing at the, uh, the police walking around with their firearms. Through negotiations, we managed to settle him down. I think I lost because I had to sit in that. You know, they used to have smoking in the airport and it'd be like a little fish tank. He wanted to smoke and I've gone, okay. And I'm sitting after being awake for about, you know, 24 hours, sitting in a, a one of those smoking, uh, I call it the fish tank, with this mad Frenchman. And uh, he, when we got him, we finally got him to... Um, uh, Charles de Gaulle, and uh, he said something very offensive to the Notre Dames that uh, were picking him up, and uh, ended up um, being dragged over the counter. And I don't know what happened to him from from there. But uh, there are some interesting experiences, isn't it? But oh. that, that's just another thing about policing. You know, you join the cops, and you don't expect you're going to be uh, doing uh, jobs like that. As I explained to these guys, you know, they said, uh, just so you sort of understand, you know, they said. Um, Drug dealers are drug dealers all over the world, and cops are cops all over the world. Yeah. So you know, yeah, that's uh, you know, it's not our fault that they don't like you in Singapore. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's an interesting, uh, interesting side of uh, side of policing. Look, I th I think that might be a good time to wrap up uh, part one. Hmm. When we come back for uh, part two, we're going to talk about a uh, uh, well, lots of your uh, excellent adventures uh, as your career uh, police officer. But one is the uh, chicken salad roll case, which is a murder case, and we will just allude to that and uh, we'll have you uh, tell, it, tell us about that. And a few other uh, stories, an interesting uh, extortion on a tattoo parlour and uh, lots of other things and your thoughts on uh, policing. Thank you, Gary. I look forward to telling you uh, about this. <laughs> I want to hear about the chicken salad roll case. <laughs> the homicide of the homicide I solved with the chicken salad roll. It's become quite famous. Actually, actually, I've actually gone up and lectured the uh, Connies about it at the academy, um, and they fi they filmed it just in the last month before I, the last okay. week before I left. Well, you, you've got you've got my interest. So it's, uh, uh, it's part of their domestic violence training now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting story. I'll uh, love to tell it to you. All right. That'll be on part two. Thank you.